I wonder how I all began. I all began as a refugee, really, from the war, because we went and lived in a little flat at the back of Denham Studios. Denham Studios was being used a lot of the time, largely for war propaganda, in which we serve, which uh, Noel Coward wrote. And he also wrote another little piece called Brief Encounter. And in Brief Encounter, he was looking for Celia Johnson's sort of eight to 10 year old son. My dad, who was a very, very good amateur actor, being the son of actors actually, uh, was performing at the Village Hall in Denham. And uh, the young director then, hardly known at all, went to see him uh, because he, I suppose he was out of petrol and couldn't get anywhere else. So anyway, he was exploring and his name was David Lean. And he was very nice to Dad. He went round afterwards and said, Arnold, if you ever want to get into the professional stage, come and see me. Well, you can imagine to a man who was struggling to keep his family uh, going on a miserable salary, uh, because he worked for Cables and Wireless. And this was a chance of his dream. So he took it and he went round, <laughs> put on his cycle clips, and <laughs> went round to see David Lean, was given a very large gin and tonic to which he was not accustomed, and popped the question, of course, David Lean had nothing for him, he was just being nice. So after the inevitable don't give up your day job, he said, have you got any children? My dad had three, younger brother, me, and my elder brother. And both he and I were taken duly and paraded in front of David Lean and the casting director on the offices at the front of Denham Studios. My elder brother was furious. He bit his nails, a habitual habit, and said, what rubbish is this? And he didn't want to be in bloody films and everything else. I was a little sort of milksop chap and I looked right. And also, of course, very importantly, I spoke right. You look at back and you think, yes, of course, David Lean used me because I sounded as if I could have been Celia Johnson's son. Now, what is it, you two? Well, Mummy, tomorrow's my birthday and I want to go to the circus. And tomorrow's not Margaret's birthday and she wants to go to the pen. So that was my, my start. Two days filming at Denham Studios in Brief Encounter, playing Celia Johnson's son. At the end of the, more, the, the day shoot, there has a bit where I'm lying in bed because I've been run over and Celia Johnson comes in and feels guilty because she's been out with Trevor Howard and the doctor says, you've been very lucky, he'll be all right. And that was the end of the shot. And uh, the first time we did it, I was so busy watching Celia Johnson, I forgot to shut my eyes. I was meant to be unconscious. So halfway through the shot, the cameraman said, cut, the boy's got his eyes open. So we had to go again. More film was shot. And when it was finished, David Lean said, that's cut. And he knelt down one side of the bed that I was in, and Celia Johnson was kneeling at the other side and said, bloody good, Celia, just bloody good. And three inches away from him, this side of me was these astonishing pair of eyes that saw everything all the time. And this side was Celia Johnson, whose luminous eyes would light a room. And they just looked at each other. And had I known, what to say, I would have said, the eyes have it, because that was me, fixed for life. Now, I remember in the evening, the follow, in the evening, suddenly they, they shouted, uh, um, cut, and I was left alone in the studio, Studio 2, at, uh, at uh, Denham Studio, big studio. And I didn't know what to do, and I'd forgotten totally that I'd undressed in a carriage. And I was just starting to cry when a marvellous woman called Frances Dillon, bloody good designer, one of our best uh, um, art directors, 
and somebody I knew, of course, she used to stay in a, a house around the back, and we, we knew her a bit, and she said, hello, Richard, how did it go? What's the matter? I said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, you worked it out. She said, well, there you are. You pop in there and get dressed, and I'll take you home. So I walked home, hand in hand, with Francis Dillon, by which time I was happy as the sound, I couldn't stop talking, and flourishing the five pounds which I'd been given for the day's filming in my hand, which I was so excited about, I'd lost halfway across the field. And she and I, this famous, wonderful woman, were on our hands and knees, looking for, <laughs> looking for silver in the middle of the long grass. Anyway, that, that was the end of that. I didn't do any work at school. Well, I couldn't in any case, I was an idiot. I was asked to leave the local prep school and find somewhere which didn't need any examination. My distraught mum found a school up in Hampstead called King Alfred School. That was the most dangerous and arbitrary and worthwhile decision she ever made on my behalf. It was wonderful. In the morning you did a sort of academic work of a sort, if it suited you. In the afternoon, you had the choice to a series of arts and crafts, and of course, I ticked drama. The, the uh, woman who taught drama there was an amazing woman, truly amazing, called Rennie Soskin. She was a Beloff. If anybody knows who the Beloffs are, there was Lord Beloff and Nora Beloff and Anne Beloff. They were a very famous uh, Jewish Hampstead family. And she gave me the chance to play, first of all, Oberon in an outdoor production. Then she saw what I was capable of. Then, unfortunately, I was ill for a year with tuberculosis. When I came back, she asked me to play Richard II. When she thought I was up to it, she asked me to play Hamlet. And that was a sort of meteoric rise to fame within a tiny little globule of society known as King Alfred School, God bless it. And at the end of that time, I was, because of the PTB, I was sort of part of Rennie's family, living in her house. And in her house, which was very splendid, facing Hampstead Heath, everybody came. Well, everybody who was anybody in Hampstead came and further afield. I met Gilgood there. I met Rosanio and Antonio, the Spanish dancers. I met uh, Tony Quayle and, oh, a whole load of others. And Tony Quayle was sufficiently impressed, I suppose, to send poor Glenn Barmshaw to see me perform in Hamlet. I don't envy him. Sitting through a, a school production of Hamlet must have been extremely painful. At the end of it, he came round, nodded briefly over the top of his bow tie, and later agreed with Tony Quayle that I was to go down to Stratford, and that was the beginning of my career proper. I arrived, I remember at Stratford, the first person I met on the train, she took me down there by train and uh, was a man called Cyril Keegan Kagan Smith. He was the head of the uh, wardrobe, all of whom were bent in some way. And uh, <laughs> Cyril uh, then became the sort of first person that I met and the first person he met in that new year, which was not a very good year. This was 1952, and it was um, it, it was old Ralph Richardson, and Margaret Layton, and Lawrence Harvey, and Tony Britton. No, Tony Tony was the next year. Um, they were they were the principal. Oh, and Siobhan McKenna, lovely Siobhan, lovely Irish Siobhan, um, and um, Ralph Richardson was giving his Prospero, which was amazing, in which I, <laughs> which I played a, a hedgehog, a sea hedgehog, and had to dip down and actually disappear in front of his feet as he walked forward. Very dangerous thing, that, actually. They wouldn't have been allowed to now, but that I did at the age of 17. And the other great performance he gave was uh, Macbeth, uh, which, for which he was not entirely cast. He was a bit old. Macbeth is quite a young killer man, and 
he was having a lot of trouble. But at any rate, he got there. And being rather cocky and sure of myself, at the opening night, I went up to him when he was standing in the wings, and I said, good luck, Sir Ralph. And before that, <laughs> Gilgood, who hated my red hair, and had it cut really, really short and dyed black, and it was standing straight up on my he uh, head, and Ralph crossed my hand, and looked at me and said, I have been looking at your hair with amazement. It looks like a Scotch hedgehog. So thereafter, if I ever write my memoirs, I will call them the memoirs of a Scotch hedgehog. The other story, but the other wonderful moment I had, I, had, I was standing in the wings watching. I watched a lot. I learned all I, I ever would have will learn, I suppose, by standing in the wings watching. And Ralph had come to the bit. Is this a dagger that I see before me? It's handled towards me, my hand. I have it got, and yet I see it still, and on its gout and dungeon gout, no, on its dungeon gouts of blood that was not there before. And he said, Johnny, I'm having difficulty here. What do you think? Do I really see this dagger? Do I really see it? How did you do it, Johnny? And, uh, Kilgood said, well, you said, how, what, what, how do I do it? It was fairly well known even by then in those days that uh, Gilgood had not shone particularly as Macbeth. It was very bad casting, he's, mm, anyway. <laughs> he came up, clambered up on stage over the orchestra rail and uh, did his fall. This is a dagger that I see before me, it's handled towards my hand. I have it not, and yet I see it still. And then it's, oh, <laughs> said Ralphie, I don't think I can do it like that, Johnny. <laughs> oh, do it how you bloody like, Ralph, said Gilgit in a terrible huff and clambered back into the stall. Oh. Uh, it was a wonderful moment of just to see them as friends and see the fact that they were in such a different style. It was amazed that year after year they appeared brilliantly in plays together and to see their friendship. I knew Gilgood, or thought I did, by his first name. Also, the uh, school I went to called their masters always by their first name or even nickname. The headmaster was Mr Montgomery and we all called him Monty and that was the, so I called everybody by their first name. This did not endear me to anybody, <laughs> not he, but except Gilgood didn't mind. But he called me out of, just to amuse himself, I think, or because he tended to get things muddled. He always called me a Martin Richards instead of Richard Martin. And he stopped me about the third rehearsal. The scene, a very short scene, um, Banquo comes out of a, a very late night uh, sitting at, at the castle and uh, he, his son has been waiting, 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 waiting in an antechamber for him and he comes out and uh, I think the, the full length of the, of, of the dialogue is, uh, what time is, what time is, is it? And uh, Fleance's answer, the moon is down, I have not heard the clock. In other words, he'd been waiting a hell of a lot of time. And uh, I said this appallingly, and then I was asked to proceed ahead of a Banquo with a torch. And uh, Banquo says, it will be rain tonight. And then the, the murderers jump on him and with shouting, let it come down and stab him to death. And all he says is, for Leon's fly. And uh, so all I had to do was fly. Anyway, I had to walk across the stage with a bloody great torch. And Kilgold was very fed up with me. He said, Martin Richards, you're walking across the stage if they were saying, look at me, I played Hamlet, aren't I pretty? Well, I was pretty once too, you know. Just walk like a normal man, for Christ's sake, walk like a normal man. So I said, mm, how, Johnny, will you show me? So again, Kilgold lumbered up on the thing and walked across the stage in what he imagined to be a normal gait. Well, 
John Gielgud can't walk normally. He stalked. He had a very strange walk. But he did, in fact, keep his eyes straight ahead of him. I'm sure he did it better than I did. But uh, everybody sort of cringed with double embarrassment. A, that I called him Johnny, and B, the <laughs> that uh, he was doing it rather badly. And uh, I can remember the stage management's face of a appalled face that I dared to ask this great man how to walk across the stage. <laughs> the next year, 1953, now that was a good year and a particularly good year for me and I felt that I was part of the company instead of just being oh, a sea hedgehog <laughs> uh, for the first time and the company was headed by a lovely cast, Peggy Ashcroft, Michael Redgrave, Marius Goring, Oh, many, many others. And the thing for me really is that I had the speech announcing Bassanio's arrival to Portia. And it is a wonderful, tender, for some astonishing, beautiful, lovely moment, Shakespeare gave a messenger a tenuant line romantic speech. This is the little speech. Where is my lady? Here, what would my lord? Madam, there is a lighted at your gate, a young Venetian, one that comes before to signify the approaching of his lord, from whom he bringeth sensible regrets to wit, besides commends and courteous her breath, gifts of great value. Yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love a day in April never came so sweet to show how costly summer was at hand, as this horse comes before his lord. It's a sweet little scene, and I think she, she has a sort of little joke at the end. <laughs> any rate, that was enough to bind her to me. For this evening, she called me his messenger, fell, of course, desperately in love with Tony Britton. And the highlight of the whole of that romance, romance was me. I borrowed a punt from our landlady, and I punted them. And they were lying at the front of the punt, and uh, we had a wonderful basket of fruit and even champagne, I remember. I hadn't much, had much champagne before that. And I lay in the back when I wasn't punting uh, with the best designer probably of the whole of that epoch, the famous Percy Harris. And she filled me full of wonderful stories of all the time she'd worked with Gilgood and Laurence Olivia and all the greats and all the wonderful designs. Look her up, Motley. She was Motley with her sister and uh, her designs are all-time great and she was a very nice person. Anyway, at the end of that season, <laughs> despite my moment of glory, uh, Glenn Baum Shaw, who was the director of productions and left all alone to cope with the Stratford season because Tony Quayle had taken another company to Australia and he made it his duty to interview every one of us and tell us whether we were in the season for the following year or not. He absolutely hated it, I discovered a long time later, but he made himself do it. And the only way he could do it for me was to be really, really nasty. I suppose you could just say honest. And he said, oh, come in, Richard, Richard. I'll take my glasses off, because he, <laughs> he used to pull at his eyebrows, come in, Richard, sit down, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, you're an experiment that hasn't worked. It's an awful pause while I took that in. Ah, so I said, I suppose I said, so no, not, not next season. So he said, no, absolutely not. So I said, could you give me any advice? <laughs> what should I do? He said, learn your trade in rep and looked down at my, his blotter. So I got up and left. And that was the end of my Stratford 
experience. And thereafter, it was, oh, it was a hopscotch hop, you know, a sort of muddle of things. I did a, a terrible tour of an absolutely unspeakably bad play called The Praying Mantis, in which Joan Collins was the lead, and I played an extremely camp opposite to her. I remember we seated, sat on the throne together at the end. It was awful. It was quite fun doing it, though. Then I walked on uh, for Gielgud in a lovely production he'd made at the Lyric Hammersmith of uh, The Cherry Orchard with Gwen Franks and Davis and Trevor Howard. Tre <laughs> Trevor was scared silly of <laughs> Gielgud. He thought they were sort of chalk and cheese. Gielgud was scared of him. He never said anything to him. And Trevor said to me, oh, I wish you, I wish you'd say something to me, even if it's fuck off. And he, they never talked, but they were both very good. It was a lovely production, and I learned a lot just by looking at that. And then I went, out of some desperation, uh, to, uh, to uh, an agent called John Penrose, who sent me up to Derby Rep. Derby Rep was weekly rep, and I arrived. Now here is a little, a little uh, sort of window of how Derby was in the 50s. I left my trunk at the station. It's a large Victorian sombre building. It was pouring with rain. I asked one or two people where the theatre was. Would theatre or, or die? Is it theatre? Theatre? I don't know. So I walked out into the rain. I was up a cobble street, which had pipes coming down from the gutter, gushing water straight onto the cobbles. cobbles. And there was, it was lined by an unbroken line of cheap down workers' cottages, in between which every three or four, there was what I learned to learn, later learned was a ginnel, in other words, a passageway. As I approached one of these passageways, a green man erupted from it, coughing really badly, and stood in the pouring rain, and the water from the gutter and from the sky poured on him, and an enormous streak of green sped down the road and disappeared, gurgling into a drain. I will never forget that as the most sombre and astonishing image of what I was now to endure. Though I liked many things about Derby and many things about Derby people, and the rep did me a lot of good. I learned what I later described to be as a very good, very bad actor. You learnt your lines fast, you learnt what you could off anybody else, and you did the job and you got on with it. Probably the most useful person for me because he was a superb timer of dialogue, was a man called Charlie Workman. Charles Workman, he was, at that time, he was the character man at Derby Rep. And he was the son of a famous man called Charles Workman, who was Gilbert and Sullivan, Gilbert's favorite comic actor. And he had a lot of the memorabilia that his father had given him. He'd spent the whole war years getting very drunk in Cairo and working <laughs> for Cairo Radio um, and by extension by the BBC uh, overseas programme. And then he'd been rescued uh, by Jerry Glaister, a funny little director, and brought back to England. And he'd, in the meantime, he'd married his rather aged landlady. So the two of them, rather sad, but Charlie had a great sense of humour and was then on the, on, totally on, on the wagon, didn't, didn't drink at all, and taught me a, probably a hell of a lot more than I even realised. Apart from Charlie Workman, the last company, not the company I was in sadly, but the last company of which Pamela Lane was still resident as a leading lady, uh, was uh, Johnny Rees, a little Welshman, and John Osborne, who was the leading man. And the three of them, Johnny Reese, John Osborne, and Pamela Lane, lived in this flat, very near Derby Cathedral, where the 
bells rung out. Now, if you know your uh, look back in anger, you will realize that that is a version of the story of the three of them together and of Osborne's anger at being penned up in this place. And rather sadly, when I joined the company, uh, Pam and he had broken up and Johnny Reese was still with us, lovely, lovely uh, little Welsh actor. Uh, but there was a sort of residual feeling of sadness there. So at the end of the season, although I was sorry to say goodbye to them, uh, that was it. My younger brother had just acquired an Austin Heavy 12 taxi, an old London taxi, and he came up, bless him, and we've stuck my trunk on top of it, and he and my dad and uh, me, we trundled down south, away from the grotty Midlands and, and, the, the, and all the poverty that was still there, still obviously there in the streets in Derby. I enjoyed Derby very much, so I did have some of the worst digs ever, ever, ever. And uh, one, on one occasion, they, I was, uh, we were sort of cornered by some a family called the Garbits. I had a, 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 a bed on the first floor and was served my meals on the ground floor. My girlfriend of the time had a flat on the top and they spied on us and eventually summoned my girlfriend's father to separate this terrible uh, sexual morass that was going on in their house. So it was a very difficult few moments <laughs> in our house, in that house, and I couldn't wait to get away. After that, I was out of work for a bit again, I think, and then I saw another um, agent. And no, before that, I had met the director of productions of Nottingham Playhouse. He'd come down to London to, and seen in spotlight offices to see as many actors as he could. And he and I sort of, no, a clicked is a wrong word for John Harrison. He is a distant and intellectual man with frighteningly um, grey eyes that sort of bore into you. At any rate, I didn't think I was getting anywhere with him and I didn't think we were really uh, going to work together. So I was bundled off to a summer season at Cleethorpes. <laughs> Cleethorpes, if you don't know it, has about four miles of sand when the tide goes out. The theatre there is on the front. Across from the road was the Guinness clock. Now, for you all too young to remember what the Guinness clock looked like, it was built for the uh, Festival of Britain and it advertised, obviously, Guinness because uh, pelicans and things came out of it every quarter of an hour and it made noises for almost five minutes when it was chiming. So you were doing a show, especially on the matinee, you would notice it somehow, uh, at Cleethorpe's rep, and uh, you just got to the bit where you had to say, yes, my lad, I plead not, plead not guilty, and this bloody chalk clock would go, clang, boom, chong, for about 10 minutes. <laughs> you couldn't pause for long enough. You had to wind your way through. So I would have thought that Cleethorpes was my particular Nadia, my particular low point. Eventually I was rescued, thank goodness, from the joys of Cleethorpes rep by a telegram from John Harrison asking me to go to Nottingham to play Florizel uh, in Winter's Tale, opposite Joan Plowright. And uh, of course, he actually, the bloke was very decent. He had to let me go at very short notice, which he did. I took the train and there I was in Nottingham. Now Nottingham at the time was a three weekly rep. It was very much better than weekly on or, or fortnightly rep. It was three weekly and the standard was extremely high, and that was due entirely to John. He had very, very high taste, very good discernment, and he was a very good, if slightly frightening, director. And we, in the cast, 
for many fine actors. And I think the, the production I remember with great joy. <laughs> Joan, I remember, I said to her on the first, third or fourth day of rehearsal, I said, are you happy to be playing Perdita? And she said, no. I said, really? Well, what, what would you rather have been playing? She said, I'd much rather have been playing Dorcas. <laughs> so I was playing opposite someone who really didn't want to be a pretty pretty, which she was, she was absolutely gorgeous, but wanted to play character. And I think that's probably where she excelled later in life. Um, at Christmas, we did John Harrison's version of Alice in Wonderland, uh, which Graham Crowden said it was about as funny as a tomb. <laughs> I played the White Rabbit. And Alice was played by Daphne Slater, who was John's wife. Beautiful, beautiful and gifted actress. She worked very little because I think it was quite hard work being John's wife. And they had a young child, at any rate. But when she did, it was enchanting and it was fun to be with her. Actually, she got me the job. John didn't think I could be the White Rabbit. He didn't see me as the White Rabbit. He was very sorry I wouldn't be the White Rabbit. <laughs> Daphne Slater came up to me, we were rehearsing another play, and said, do your John Gielgud imitation. And I said, John, to John Harrison, I've got an idea, I've got for a voice. So I did this sort of terrible imitation of, of uh, John Gielgud, you know, I'm late, I'm late, I'm terribly late. And John, at the end of this, sucked his pencil for a bit and said, you are the white rabbit. So it <laughs> got me in. Later, John and I became very good friends. Uh, and I, I regret that at the end of the season, I was yet again, as usual, plunged into the abysm of going up into to the uh, uh, to Marabone Labour Exchange and presenting my card and getting my four pounds ten. After White Rabbit, <laughs> which Graham Crowden always called me, White Rabbit, White Rabbit, how are you, White Rabbit? And we had a great time together, sharing dressing rooms. And then I was threatened with being out of work for about three weeks while there was a gap, something I wasn't going to be in. And amazingly, uh, Derby Rep wanted a juvenile, and I was able to fit a juvenile in while rehearse, only a week rehearsal, week playing, before I was due back into the company at Nottingham. And this I did with great joy, go back and see old friends. And uh, I, about halfway through the run, I went back to Derby from Nottingham, where I was, of course, living at the time, and found that the theatre had burnt down. One of two theatres had burnt down while I was working with them. And that was the end of that. So I worked with a bit more for, for John, and then I went down to London and back to being out of work. So, but it was a nice thing. Funnily enough, very interesting to compare the two companies, the Derby Rep using only the movements that are down in the uh, recognised version of the play and never, never uh, um, inventing anything of their own and Nottingham where John would take a bare text, reinterpret it, and uh, create something new and specially his and wonderful, usually with it. Uh, I learned a great deal from him. It wasn't until I became a director later that I put all that into action, but by gosh. And also the other person I remember with great fondness is a wonderful designer called Wojtek, who is Polish, and he made that tiny stage in, uh, at Nottingham, sing with life and invention. And it, it was so shallow, and yet he, didn't, he knew never for one moment that the act, thought the actors were working sideways on. Him and John together made a, a, a sort of totality which drew the audience in. It was a very nice little theater to work for, I can tell you, working. It used to be Pringle's Picture Palace. <laughs> and now I've never been up to the new theatre, which looks wonderful, but I think we had something very special, largely created by John Harrison at Nottingham. 
there's always bits where you are doing nothing or do very little or become waiters or something. At any rate, that was one of them after Nottingham, which was quite an exciting period in my life. Except that when I went back the next season while I was out of work to see my then girlfriend at, at uh, Nottingham, I contracted uh, polio of the throat. And I was very ill and shipped off to an isolation hospital. And for a, quite a long time, oh, a bit like that, <laughs> I couldn't move, move my lips or my throat. I had to be fed by a tube and I thought, oh God, this is the end of my acting career. And only slowly, only slowly did I uh, return to be able to use my lips. And they've never been right since, but they're good enough to drink with and good enough to speak with, and that is, has to be good enough for me. At any rate, that was a nasty, there were, it was rampant in, uh, in Nottingham, in the whole of the Midlands at the time. Uh, I did, while I was recovering, I went to see my old uh, mentor, uh, Tony Quayle, in View from, View from a Bridge, View from a Bridge. And I went round to ask him afterwards, and he was lying in his bath, <laughs> that sort of man. He said, oh, come in, Richard, he said, what are you doing, lad? Uh, it didn't sound quite like that, actually. And I said, well, I've been, I've been ill. Oh, poor lad, poor lad, he said. Have anything on the horizon? I said, yes, actually. I have been asked to go back to do one thing at the rep that I very much enjoyed, Nottingham, uh, to play stand-up in Journey's End. Ah, he said, have you read Under Fire by Henri Babousse? I said, no. Oh, all oh, right, OK, read it before you go. He will find a translation. Can you read it in French? I said, no. Oh, you can find a translation in English. Read it. And disappointed by, I can't remember who that's by. Anyway, he gave me two books to read, which I've read, read religiously, and Under Fire is well worth reading for anybody wanting to, to uh, understand the First World War. It was a great help to me. But that was only a one-off, and then life trailed on. And then one of the great glories of my career, really, as it happened, a man called Brian Bailey, who was running Guildford Rep, asked me to go down to play something. I can't even remember what I played first. The moment he saw me, he wanted me to join the company and be a regular, and I was for about ooh, six months at least. What I didn't know, until it was made clear, that he was already well online to be the first director of the Belgrave Theatre in Coventry, which in itself was the first new theatre to be bought, built in Britain after the war. So it was all with a great sense of excitement that we were all, myself included, asked to join up with this new company in this new theatre. The company consisted of many actors who have now become legendary. Uh, Frank Finlay, Patsy Byrne, Cherry Morris, Alan Howard, many others, many others. I could list a whole load, and they were all very good company, and we were, had a wonderful time together. Yes, it was indeed very lucky that I met Brian and all those wonderful people, and we did a lot of good stuff. And some of it was had, had, had tours, so we went quite a lot of times. We went across to... Um, to, to Coventry, no, to, not to Coventry, to Cambridge, and played there. And on one occasion we did a, a sort of four little playlets joined together called Call It Love. It didn't go anywhere, they liked it well enough at, at uh, Coventry, but uh, it, it died the death after we finished with it. And we went on, suddenly there appeared on the, on the scene a young writer called Arnold Wesker, wonderful, gifted Jewish young man, and with him a director called John Dexter. John Dexter was famous as being probably one of the most vituperative, most dangerous, and probably the most gifted uh, director of his time. And fortunately, praise God for my quiet of mind, I'd known him before because he'd come and 
acted with us when we, and there was a derby. So I was a friend, and he needed a friend at then because he just had come out of prison, having been uh, accused of a sort of uh, attempted, at any rate, uh, interfering with young men. So he was absolutely at the bottom of his pocket uh, and at the bottom of his uh, courage. But he still came down and he'd latched on to Arnold, who'd written this play called Chicken Soup and Barley, and Dexter made it his. It was his direction, his sense of purpose and a feeling for the play and bullying anybody who stood in his way that made it an instant success. And on the back of that, Arnold wrote two other plays. One was Roots, which just happened to have Joan Plough out in it, which was the best thing she ever did, and it was brilliant, playing Beatty. And finally, I'm talking about Jerusalem. Now, I played Dave in the first. They were all plays linked together. They were all about his family. He wrote about what he knew. Arnold never wrote fanciful things. He all wrote, always wrote what he knew, what he trusted, and what he could express. Uh, we lived all together in the house in King Richard Street, of which there are many tales that I could tell. But the result was that we were all bonded together, and it was not at all surprising to me that uh, Alan Howard was asked to play my part, Dave, which is all about him in I'm Talking About Jerusalem. Alan joined our company quite late, and you only had to stand with him for five minutes to know that he was going to make it. He was an important actor. He had a, a, a command uh, and a grace and a certain amount of danger in him that was undeniable. Forced with that, I have to say, and he became a friend, I liked him very much. I was, I have to admit that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, equal him in, in, in charisma, at least. And uh, I was right. So when all three of, es of Wesker's plays went to the Royal Court, I was kind of in a limbo, and I was, I remember lim I was doing something to my old Austin 12. I was underneath it, I think I was actually taking the pistons out in between the matinee and evening performance, and suddenly this face appeared looking down through the bonnet, past the engine at me, and it was Brian Bailey. He said, good Lord, Dicky, what are you doing? I said, I think I've just got time to change my, this piston before the evening performance. He said, can you do that? I said, yes, I can do quite a lot of things that aren't acting, and I enjoy doing them. And he said, well, what are we going to do with you when you go up, when this tiny part in uh, Roots, you don't really want to do that, do you? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> One line part. It's boring to hell. And then I said something that I hadn't rehearsed at all. Just came out. I said, you wouldn't let me direct, would you, Brian? And the moment I'd said it, I knew that it had fulfilled an un, unarticulated uh, desire inside me. He said, do you want to? I said, yes. He said, right. And within it would seem a miraculously short time. He says, this is a good time for you because all the rest of the actors, your mates are up in London uh, rehearsing and playing uh, the, uh, the Wesker trilogy and you'll be down here, I'll get a new cast. You'll do, uh, do a thriller first of all, it's midsummer. Uh, they'll only come for a thriller. I can't remember the name of the thriller now, but I did it, I enjoyed it. It all worked and Brian was magnanimous. He said, okay, he said, now, you are an associate director of the Belgrade Theatre. You are a director from now on. It was his, almost his decision to say that that's where you're going and that's what you do. And I had a short, sadly, too short a time. I directed one thing with him, 
called Never, uh, Never Had It So Good by John Wiles, which was a play all about uh, Coventry. And we took that to Stratford East. And then he said, right, I want to talk to you about next season. And I said, hang on, hang on. He was a very pushy man. He was in a hurry. I said, I want a break. And I'm going to Ireland. And I went to Ireland and I just bought a car, hired a car and toured Ireland by myself just to see it and just to touch where my grandmother came from in dear, dirty Dublin. And then I came back and he phoned me up almost directly. And he said, Dickie, uh, I want to see you at the last, it's the last night of uh, uh, Never Had It So Good at Stratford East. I want to meet you there in the bar at 8.30. So I went up and I watched the curtain go up on Never Had It So Good. And then I went to the bar and I went to the bar and I sat and I sat. And at the end of the show, the director, the stage director came round, Chris, and said, Richard, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Brian has killed himself on the motorway. <sighs> well, it was a waste of a great talent, a personal friend, and a great shock. And it was for a long time, I didn't even want to do anything. But I wanted to go on directing. And I was lucky enough to have the ear of Eric Longworth, who was the then to had taken over from Brian at Guildford, and with whom we'd had quite a lot of ties and connections. And I started to direct. At the same time, miraculously, uh, a, a London producer had taken up Call It Love and was turning it into a, a, a musical and wanted to recast it and he wanted to use me because I did one funny thing in the middle of it, nothing very much. And my future wife, the wonderful Suzanne Neve, was to play the juvenile leads in all four things. And we start, rehearsed that. We played it first of all, I can't remember where, but maybe we at Coventry, we took it back to Coventry, I can't remember. And we went to Brighton that absolutely loved it. They thought it was terrific. We thought, oh, ha, ha, we're on to a success here. We took it to uh, London, where it lasted four days at Wyndham's. It was the shortest run of any musical in the West End. Fortunately, please God, I at least was at that time starting to direct at Guildford, where I became a resident director. And Susie and I had fallen desperately in love and had a wonderful, magic few summers. Me, impecunious, her father disapproving politely and sweetly, and both of us very, very happy. While I was uh, directing in rep, I, was, I wanted to make films badly. Uh, I'd seen some of those sort of films you never forget. So the Seventh Seal was the film that really said to me loud and clear, this is what I want to do. Brilliant, brilliant film. And uh, so I kept writing to the BBC with no result at all. The BBC was Oxbridge or bugger off. And then, the then uh, head of drama uh, died, I think, and a lovely man, his assistant, took his place for a short time, and he'd been an actor, so he was interested in my application, and I actually got an interview with the BBC. <laughs> and this was my bit of luck. I happened to be directing uh, Henry V at Guildford, uh, with Corinne Redgrave. So I, as I came into the room, I said, I'm awfully sorry, uh, you're running a bit late and I, I've got a cast waiting for me at Guildford. And they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing Henry VIII with, uh, with uh, Corinne. And so that sort of notched me up. They asked me what my camera was, because I said I was a, 
a keen photographer and I said, well, I can't afford a, a reflex camera, but that's what I really want. But I'm, I work with a, a Kodak Retinet 2B, which is not the top of the range, let's face it. Uh, but the, I, I was made by that luck. So I got into BBC. As a trainee director, unfortunately, the training was appalling. Uh, but the fact that I was there and was mixing with people who knew was enough. I was spat out and I was quite haughty with them. I said, I'm not going to do um, uh, soap operas. I hate, I hate soap operas. I, I really didn't want to do them. Uh, but I, and I want to explore the subtext and the supernatural. Um, I, I not, not do sort of police series, things like that. And that this was all the wrong things uh, I, uh, I said to them. And I also did a, a programme which I wrote myself as a sort of passing out piece, which wasn't very good, I have to say. At any rate, I was given a play to do, and then astonishingly they didn't know what to do with me. And there was a very well-known director called Philip Savile, uh, who'd come over from ITV and was being asked to do a, a production of Hamlet at in Helsingor Castle and they decided he needed some help uh, and that I was, a, they didn't know what to do with me so they said go and be Sal uh, Savile's assistant. Philip Savile is unhelpable. He didn't care a hell or know much about Hamlet but he knew the hell a lot about shooting old castles. <laughs> there ensued a series of astonishing uh, rehearsal periods in England, which were quite arid. Uh, the fraud actors were left totally on their own, while Philip jumped about with an eyepiece, looking at the best possible shots he could get of them. <laughs> and uh, at one time, our Hamlet said, Philip was halfway up the wall bars of a, a, a school we were rehearsing in, looking for a nice low shot down on Hamlet <laughs> and poor Christopher Plummer was trying to get at the roots of Hamlet and he stopped rehearsing and said, Philip, Philip, will you come off those fucking boys? Will you come down and give me a hand please? Now! <laughs> Philip shrugged and came down. He was quite unstoppable. The two of them hated each other, quite rightly I think, because uh, poor old uh, Chris was not given any help. He was a bit old for Hamlet, but he's a bloody good actor, let's face it, and he deserved better at the hands of a director. We all trogged out to Elsinore. All the actors were given double pay, and the whole thing was going to be recorded in four days by um, uh, Swedish television, Danish television, Danish television. <laughs> so all the best cameras, the best camera line, the best lighting and everything had been moved out to Elsinore, and the uh, the um, Danish television was almost at a stop. It was just ticking over while we occupied its best people for four days. The shooting went on for 15 days. It became a, a national incident. We nearly closed down the station. Philip and the cameraman, uh, he was so arrogant and they said, <laughs> one man said to him, we like Philip very much. Uh, we would like to do what he wants to us to do, but he doesn't tell us. If he doesn't tell us, I will knock his block off. <laughs> and thus it went. By the end of 15 days, hardly any sleep, we stayed in a beautiful hotel down the road called the Marian List Hotel, who looked after us brilliantly. But there was a lot of incidents. I'll tell you one incident which sort of <coughs> illustrates We'd been filming for a long time, we were very tired, Chris was exhausted, and I was down in the uh, moat with Chris and the, and the, uh, the cameraman and, and sound man, and, and <laughs> uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning. Several had finally been told to get back into the scanning wagons, which were the other side of the castle, about a quarter of a mile away and direct, like a television director, instead of standing, 
shifting his trousers with his things and uh, asking people to do new and different things at the last minute. Uh, anyway, we came to the bit where the ghost speaks to Hamlet after he's departed and makes him swear to do, to do what he says, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. <laughs> and I was there to give, um, give Chris just the go-ahead quietly because he didn't like the big um, speakers that we had down there coming from the, uh, the, the scanning wagons. So we came to it. Chris was already, he'd hyped himself up and I got him on my earphones, I got, give him the go-ahead action and so I quietly gave him the little, okay, go ahead. And as he said, swear upon this sword, the, the sound man fell asleep and he was holding a fishpole microphone and he just fell very slowly in front of shot. So <laughs> Philip was doing this and this thing came in and I grabbed hold of him and stopped him actually falling, otherwise he'd have fallen on the floor. So we got then Philip, the other side of the moat, if you remember, pressed the tit and an enormous echoing voice that went right and right around the moat said, OK, cut, go again. What's the matter with the guy? I said to him, sorry, sorry, he fell asleep. Said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Philip, I'm sorry. I, OK, fine, fine, no problem, no problem, no problem. <laughs> and then Philip went on, he said, ah, oh, Chris, uh, zap it up a bit, will you? It's, uh, you know what, it's kind of lost, kind of got, got to, mm, ah, it's, it's, it's dull. And give it, give it something, uh, give it something, huh? And I saw, I saw Christopher Plummer's face turn from just tired to pure fury. And he said, uh, Philip, uh, are you listening to me? Yes, yes, came the voice. Will you come round here? Will you come here on the floor, please? And give me, if you have some direction, after three weeks rehearsal and two weeks Recording. If now you're going to give me a bit of direction, you come down on the fucking floor and give it me face to face, or I'm off on the next aeroplane. Okay. Philip came down. We all stood about. They walked up and down, <laughs> and then Philip went away, and we did it again. And I got the same thing. Okay, give him, give him the, give him the uh, thumbs up. Let him go. Be quiet to him. So I gave him the thumbs up and he said, which camera are, are we on? That one. Okay, he said, there, close up. Give me close up. I absolutely hate, detest and despise these two-bit fucking television directors. Give them a camera for two minutes and they uh, think they are God Almighty, they are nothing. They know nothing, and they are worse than the dog shit on my shoe. They want a radicating swear upon this saw. It was a wonderful, wonderful bit, and <laughs> uh, Chris wanted that to go on record, and I have it on record that when they got the tapes back to England, Philip had that bit of tape cut and he jumped on it in the basement to make sure nobody could ever, ever see it again. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment. I have to say that Chris was justified and Savile was, you know, absolutely what he described. The only thing is, I will say in, 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 in uh, Savile's defence, is that he was a, a great innovator of new camera positions for old cameras. He got those cameras, probably they, they were ruined, half of them, he got them dropped on the floor, he got them hauled up onto balconies, and they were not little things. We're talking of, of this sort of thing, that big, which it weighs a lot. And if you tilt it a little bit more than that way or that way, it, it, you, you kill the, um, uh, the, the back, which records it, and it's on, into a 30,000 pound refit. So <laughs> Philip, 
as well as stopping um, Danish television and causing a, a great incident and the actors making a fortune out of it because after the four days which they were already paid for they yeah, contracts were torn up and they made and they went on to film co contracts many people said Philip Savile would never work again actually he did and he made one of the best things I have ever seen on television well, of course it was brilliantly written and he did it very well, except the end where he went over the top. And that was the boys from the black stuff. And I think he will be remembered uh, quite rightly as doing that brilliantly. Anyway, <laughs> that was my initiation into, I'm nobody's assistant in any case. I wasn't going to help him. He didn't, he didn't care about the text. And the text to me is important. I had, after all, played it at the age of 17. Anybody who plays Hamlet thinks they own it. Uh, but I knew the text and I could have and would have helped uh, Chris Plummer, but this was not my job. So I just stood by and watched this shambles go on. However, I have to say that it was sold to American television and because of Christopher Plummer being already a film star, it was sold very well. There were various other fairly, fairly dubious things going on at the same time. <laughs> The man, the woman who was playing uh, the Queen, June Tobin, was voluptuous and brilliantly cast. Philip was a good casting person. And uh, she was ready for every, everything and anything at the time. And one cameraman fell desperately in love with her. And we shared, Sue came out with me and stayed with me while we were there. And we shared. Uh, room bedrooms next door to June Tobin and we heard the most awful things going on next door. <laughs> One moment where we heard this cameraman saying, June, June, I am ready for you, June. So you can imagine <laughs> we didn't get any sleep that night and probably neither did she. She subsequently settled down and married Peter Luke, who was the producer and I don't, I don't think she acted from then on. I, don't, I never saw her again. She was good in that. Just my old friend Roy Kinnear, who I'd been in rep with at Nottingham, played the gravedigger. And there were other people there. There was Bob Shaw playing the king. And so it was a lot of, a lot of friendly people all around me. And it was a nice time for me, despite the fact that I felt I could be of no help. <laughs> and they have subsequently said that although not perhaps the greatest hamlet in the world, it was the greatest tour of Elsingor Castle you could ever have in the most dramatic situation. So I suppose Philip, to that extent at least, is exonerated. Finally, <laughs> Michael Caine's Horatio was the most absurd bit of casting. And Mike was absolutely delighted because he used to say, I used to go and knock on the door of the old vic and say, can I hold a spear? <laughs> and they said, no, you're from the East End of London, bugger off. <laughs> and here I am with a lead part in Shakespeare and earning a bomb. So up to them. <laughs> it was very funny, very funny. And he was very funny about Chris Plummer. Chris had done a lot of filming, was very expert. And Chris and uh, Mike said, <laughs> it's a funny thing, you know, every time Chris tells me, which he does quite a lot during the movie, how much he relies and loves me. He grabs hold of my shoulders and turns me downstage to camera. So all they see is my one ear. But I don't care. It's his movie. It's fine. I know that at the end, he dies and I have my moment. I can wait till then. <laughs> and he did. And he did. And when he got up with flights of angels, sing thee to thy rest, he was crying. He was crying, really crying. And it was intensely moving. And at that moment, I forgave him all his lack of Shakespeare and said, my God, you're a bloody good actor. And so he was and so he is, my goodness. Finally. I think the BBC found something for me to do because a new woman arrived 
and there weren't many women producers at the BBC. They didn't like them, and they certainly didn't like ITV, and they certainly didn't like people who hadn't come from Oxbridge. But she was brought in by Sidney Newman, a newly appointed head of drama, and she, her name was Verity Lambert. And she was given the task of bringing an idea of, that had been muted and, and developed slowly before, but never got anywhere, of a, a science fiction series called Doctor Who. And she, for better or worse, was given me. <laughs> and I was the first with another director called Chris uh, to do the uh, Daleks. And we did two the Daleks together. We did three each. And then he went somewhere to do something else. He didn't want to do Daleks anymore. And I did I did Doctor Who for over a year, about a year and a half. I did, I think, five series. Daleks Invade Earth. Oh, I can't remember all of them. And they were appallingly written, <laughs> but they were imaginative. And we had to do them on a shoestring. The Daleks were made here in Uxbridge for £350 each. And bits of already created uh, um, plastic were used, and of course, famously, <laughs> a, a sink uh, blocker was used as the, the 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 hand. It wasn't entirely that was my suggestion, but I didn't say stick a a, a lavatory blocker de blocker on the end. I said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we had a, a magnet that would attract everything, not just metal, but anything, including including a uh, food. And that if the Dalek wanted to eat, it would just stick this thing at it, and the thing, be it a dog or a, a human being, so would be sucked in. Uh, what we got was a lavatory brush, which was all that the BBC could afford. Nevertheless, it had gone into <laughs> the Oxford Dictionary, and it has lasted, and the programme has lasted. I was exhausted by the end of it, and thank God I got out and did other things. <laughs> One little anecdote which I remember, I did some good filming for Doctor Who before we were confined to the studio, which was a lime grove and quite useless for these sort of expansive, and, and I wanted to be very exciting visual uh, sci-fi things. But we did some good filming. We started at midnight on uh, uh, Trafalgar Square. We had to bribe some hippies to disappear, apart from that, Trafalgar Square was empty, and we were, as the dawn came up, we were able to shoot some Daleks weaving in amongst the lions there when we came running up the mall, and we finally did a shot of one Dalek coming, I wanted it at speed, it was never quite at speed, over Westminster Bridge at us with, uh, of course, the House of Commons in the background, and I wanted nothing else. I wanted an empty bridge. Uh, it was very difficult. There was uh, then it, less traffic than now, obviously, <laughs> but there was still one all-night bus. So we got, I'd, I'd had the Daleks re-wheeled, re, um, so they were a little faster. They were built on, on um, pedal tricycles. And I got this one Australian guy, the toughest of them. He only just fitted inside the Dalek, but I thought he was the right man to get some speed to come over the bridge towards us, towards camera. <laughs> he was at the top. I got an agonised thing over the over the uh, intercom from the other side, from the Westminster side, saying, "I'm lying in front of the bus to stop it coming over from my from my uh, uh, first assistant. Please go now." So we were all in a bit of a hurry. We cranked up the camera. I said, "Go," and he didn't do it fast enough. So I shouted halfway through, go back and start again. I wasn't very polite. And he came over at a reasonable speed, straight at camera, went over, and then the Dalek fell over and skidded. And they dig, dug him out, and I think he was somewhat bruised. And <laughs> an aficionado of Doctor Who came from Australia and interviewed me years and years later and said, uh, he still hates you and knows about you and talks about you with deep loathing. He now runs a gym in Sydney or somewhere and will recall this terrible moment where this idiot director nearly killed him. <laughs> anyway, 
that was my Doctor Who experiences, one way and another. Then I went on to, to better things, some of which I was very proud of. I was very proud of, of um, doing William & Mary by Roald Dahl uh, with Brenda Bruce and uh, um, Donald Sindon and Andre Van Geisekum, lovely actor, Andre Van Geisekum. And if anybody knows that short story, it's perfect about a very disagreeable uh, a professor <laughs> who has his brain uh, removed from him just before his death and kept in uh, a solution of lukewarm ringers <coughs> solution and so he can still think but he can't be anything else <coughs> and Brenda Bruce his hen pecked well in this case professor pecked uh, wife who the moment he's dead starts smoking and eating chocolates <laughs> any rate I was proud of that and a lot of others Another one of our late-night horrors was a thing called Kiss of Death, and it had starred Dion Cilento. And unfortunately, Dion Cilento didn't take television very seriously. She was already a film star. And also, she didn't know how the hell to put on a corset. And I was delayed in recording, which is a great fault and danger because she put her corset on upside down. I think she'd had a few of these uh, beforehand. <laughs> I got this agonizing thing up in, the, uh, up in the, the control box saying, sorry, Deanna's going to be a little late. We're having to put her corset on, corset on again. And of course, the corset on goes on first and all the rest of flummery goes on afterwards. So I think we were a quarter of an hour late starting. Uh, fortunately, it was a fairly simple piece and I completed just about on time. I was never well known for completing on time. Once I got recording, I believed that it would take as long as it takes and I was going to get what I want. This got me into a lot of trouble because recording time is very, very limited and very precious and very expensive. And if you go over line by two minutes, the entire crew of a studio, which is considerable, have an hour's overtime at double time. And if you go over that and are likely to go over the hour, they will, they, you know, they, they earn the same again. So, I finally left the BBC. Then I went up to Granada and it was very fortunate I went up. My stock was quite high and I was asked to do a special uh, uh, episode of The Family at War which was a very good series, which uh, had been running for some time when I got there. And I was asked to do the torpedoing of the, um, all those steamers that went out from England to get to people out to Canada. And the e-boats came and, uh, and knocked the hell out of them. So I had to do uh, a series of small boats, lifeboats, with dying people in them. And we went and filmed uh, off London No Pair. And I got really excited and we went further and further out and <laughs> as I got better and better shots until finally we lost track of land totally. And my, my PA said, Richard, Richard, have you got what you want? Because I can't see the coast. <laughs> and oh, wonderful, wonderful sound man he couldn't take the sea at all. I was so excited I didn't feel sick. The, the little boats, ours which with the camera in it and the, the, the lifeboats with the dying so sailors in it were bobbing about like crazy. He was being sick over the side but he was still managing to hold the boom. He got the sound, God bless him. But the moment I said, all right, cut, let's find the land, <laughs> I started to feel sick too because it was rough. But it was good. It was good filming, and that was good, and that, and that took, put me in good stock for the, my long period at, the, at, at Granada. Afterwards, I did a series which was very good, Janet Munro and um, Andrew Keir in a, a religious thing, which was called uh, Adam Smith. And those were good because it was written by Trevor Griffiths. Trevor Griffiths, who doesn't believe in 
God, certainly doesn't believe in, in Christianity, was asked to do a, a religious series about uh, a, a vicar working in a small parish with difficulty. And he said to them, he said, I will only write it if the following is observed as my truth, that Christianity equals socialism. And they said, oh yes, yeah, fine, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. And while I was with him, and while we did it, or while we were doing the first episodes, uh, that was absolutely okay by them. But then he wanted to go further afield, and wanted to end the first series. In the beginning of the second series, he wanted Adam Smith, this middle-aged and highly charged and very lonely um, um, pastor to go over to Glasgow, leave the comfort of uh, Edinburgh and, and around there, and fall in love with a socialist uh, worker and, and uh, um, academic in Glasgow University and have an affair with them. And we, we were told, no, he couldn't have an affair. He could, he could be fond of, but he couldn't have an affair. And we had an absurd conversation because uh, um, Trevor Griffiths refused to not write what he wanted to write. And we were all hauled up. The only time I've been on the board, up in the boardroom of Granada, the producer, uh, the uh, Trevor, and uh, the, the uh, story woman, who is very bright, Susie Hush. <laughs> and then um, the, I think he was the, I think he was the chairman of Granada at the time, came in. And uh, we had this conversation which went absolutely nowhere because in the middle of this, Trevor produced a large pouch and rolled the most astonishingly large spliff you've ever seen on the boardroom table and lit up. <laughs> All of us were slowly getting, I think, a little high and the producer was a slightly fussy, silly woman. <laughs> said, to get me very stuffy in here. Could we open a window? <laughs> and Trevor just repeating the same things. You know, he said, you know, socialism is Christianity. Christianity is Socialism, oh, it is nothing, it's fucking nothing. So we got nowhere. And I think that's where Adam Smith more or less died the death. With Granada, I did the best film I've ever shot. And I was one of the few things I've done where I've said at the end, that's what I want, that's what I meant, that's right. I was happy with it. And I'm, strangely, I'm still happy with it. There exists remotely, I believe, on television somewhere, uh, a copy of it. And it's called The Higgler, and it was a short story by H. E. Coppard, which was part of a series of Coppard and Bates we did, and they were under the generic title of um, Country Matters, which is a quote from, from Hamlet. Uh, but that was just bound them together as country stories. And Coppard was famous for his stories about the countryside and was extremely um, compressed in what he wrote and the way he wrote it. They're, they're brilliant short stories and this made a very, very good uh, one and a half hour film. And we, I had a lovely cast. Keith Drinkle played the Higgler, which was what it was called, and played it brilliantly. And uh, Mary Wimbush played his ancient mother. And I got them to do a sort of, a sort of Bristolian accent because I didn't want it a northern piece. The Higgler was unique in its, in its, it was ready to shoot. It was produced by a very, very brilliant, this brilliant uh, producer <laughs> called Derek Granger, and he was very supportive. Once he has a good idea, he follows it all the way through, and I was not, I was not restricted in any way. And the Higgler was, he was behind me a thousand percent, and that we did, we were very proud of it, very, both of us. And uh, <laughs> we had a good cast. And a beautiful, beautiful girl played called Sheila Ruskin. 
and she was a delight to watch and delight to photograph and delight to be with actually. They were a good cast and we were out there uh, on the uh, bit of the Yorkshire Moors and a lot of it in Derbyshire uh, filming it where it's at and a lot of it was up on the Devonshire estate where we, everything was, has been the same for so long. It, it is set, the Higley is set in the 1920s and there they were, all the cottages. Oh. <laughs> when we finished filming up on the uh, Derbyshire estate, we looked for a pub and there was, in the middle of this little village, high on the hillside, was um, a, a, a cottage halfway down and it had a tiny pub saying Devonshire Arms. So we went in there and we looked for, we had to go into the front parlour and the front parlour and it had no sign of any, any drink at all. But we sat down and an ancient woman came and said, what you want? <laughs> and we said, beer. Oh, how many points? We told her, she disappeared. She then brought them in a the tray. I think we were allowed a second pint and then the third pint she said, You've had enough, and I've got friends coming. <laughs> Took our glasses and departed. That's how primitive it was, how long ago it seemed. It was a real time lapse. Uh, but it all, it all sort of uh, joined in with this feeling that we got through of the 1920s in remote parts of England where there wasn't enough to eat and there wasn't enough growing and there wasn't enough anything. The real low, low, part of, uh, of English life, English existence. Anyway, I did other things with Granada, but that was by far the best. Poor Sue, my wife, who had a very good career, very busy career in television and film, but we had just got our first child, and that was when I was filming up in Yorkshire, and I hauled her up there. I think I took a plane up to, uh, remembering vaguely, up to Granada, and she drove my father-in-law's uh, Rover 110, lovely car, but very, very heavy, and she had to drive it up for me with our baby in the back, and we stayed at, uh, at Harrogate, and uh, it was a hell of a thing for her because I had to leave her all day to do filming. But she did join me on the pass uh, over the Pennines when we did a, a shot, a, a Higgler type shot uh, for Sue. She man finally managed to find the film unit right in the middle of a valley in front of an old gamekeeper's cottage. At, we just settled down to a nice late uh, lunch and the, uh, uh, the gamekeeper came down and all the uh, people who'd been up on the moors shooting, we'd heard them variously during the day whacking the hell out of the poor grouse and they came down with their, in their Land Rovers and I remember astonishingly seeing the Land Rover open and perhaps a hundred birds slither out like liquid onto the, onto the moorland floor and she, Sheila Ruskin got absolutely angry. She said, I'm going to tell them that they're pigs. I'm going to do it now. Richard, I'm sorry, I can't not. And we had to hold her down. But then a big row occurred. The gamekeeper, who only said that we could film there when his lords and masters weren't there, and then they'd come off the hill early and we'd, we'd clash. And he did something which he would never have done if he hadn't got to sort of display his manhood, he kicked his cottage door, cottage gate open, stood in front of it with his arms folded and his legs apart. And it was an entrance into the cottage he never used. He always went the side way. Of course, we'd been up to see him before. And he yelled, who is responsible for this? <laughs> My first assistant. Uh, and I looked at each other, and I'm afraid it was his job. I wouldn't have been very good. He was brilliant. He was brilliant. He walked very slowly up to this angry man who was busy displaying uh, for, the, for the sake of his, his paymasters, 
that he was Lord and Master of the, of the Dales, and he squatted down in front of him so that this boy, he was no more than a boy, could have easily put his great big uh, um, shoes, boots in his face and had started to explain it. And the mere gesture of this within danger took the energy, took the anger out of the boy and he then ended my, my first said, ended by saying, but we are finished now and we will depart and you will not see us again, thank you so much. And we trolled off. Poor Sue had to watch all this and hold, I think she had to keep Sheila down and quiet while this placatory exercise was, uh, was uh, done. I was summoned from Granada uh, back to the BBC to do the second episode of Elizabeth R, which was their big thing with Glenda Jackson playing Elizabeth. And I think there were six episodes. Mine was the second with Alençon, the French lover who was imported uh, rather late uh, in, in their sort of grandeur to, to find a, a, a husband for Elizabeth who would be associated with the royal family and not a nuisance. Uh, and so I was plunged into this and as luck would have it, the director of the first episode was an idiot. <laughs> Glenda took immediate dislike to him because he started the rehearsals by saying, I don't want to hear anything about uh, uh, motivation. I will give you places to go, you go there and you stay until I tell you to move. And she crossed his name out of the, <laughs> out of the script. And a few days later, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know this, I went, I saw her in the canteen and I went up to her and said, I'm your second director. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with you enormously. Uh, it's very exciting for me. Is there anything you want me to tell me? And she just gave me, <laughs> gave me a hard look and said, I don't think so. I think I'll just get this over one, this first one over first. And both she and uh, uh, and the rest of the cast, I knew some of the rest of the cast from Strapper quite well. Uh, we all got on very well. And Glenda went to the producer and said, can this director do the rest of them? Which didn't please the producer at all. He was very jealous of me. <laughs> Not a nice man, it has to be said. And uh, he said no, because what he wanted to direct one of them himself. Anyway, there were other good directors uh, already lined up. But I had, I had a little feather in my cap. And I could, Glenda knows what she wants to do. She's a very difficult person to change her ideas once she has them. But there was a moment when she progressed out, all the courtiers were bowing, and she'd previously had uh, a, a, a big near love affair with the character played by Robert Hardy, by Tim Hardy. And I said, would it be out there, dear Glenda, if you just paused for a microsecond and caught his eye and then moved on? It was punctuated. And it's an, uh, a thing from the last episode. And she looked at me for a second and she said, no. No, I wouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't try to argue with her, you know. She had decided that Elizabeth is the sort of person who totally cuts off the things she doesn't want and goes for the things she wants, which is fair enough, absolutely her, her decision, so right. But Tim Hardy loved it. And he came, I suddenly got a grip on the arm and he said to me, very, very low voice, he said, however, he said, if you look very carefully and very closely, you will see it in my left eye. And I did, I did, and it was well worthwhile, despite the fact that she walked straight past him. <laughs> uh, Tim and I were great friends thereafter, of course, and when I eventually, right at the end of my career, I did uh, All Creatures Great and Small, we got on famously, and he was a very, very uh, fiery man. He could easily be a difficult man to work with, but I found him a honey bun, and, and we enjoyed our time. And that was really the end of my 
television career, all creatures great and small, television had suddenly lost its uh, money. It was being threatened by all sorts of things. It never no longer had, was, they used to call it, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the right to print money. And so the extra bits of money uh, that were, I usually had to spend to do what I wanted to do were not available. And I know, and I knew then that I was always known as an expensive director. So when they were looking at, for directors, you want a cheap director who'll do it under under budget on time. You know, he'll give you what you he'll give you the story. He'll get it done, no bother. Or you can have so and so and so and so. And I was amongst the five or six of them who say, "Who'll oh, spend your money but give you something extra?" And I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of work. So eventually, I. Mm, I thought, okay, let's do something else. I met a very bright man, Alfred Granada, who set me on a course, uh, and he, uh, he eventually became Tony Blair's publicity assistant. But he, for a short time, he was actually the head of BBC's, BBC television. Um, and he had, when he was up at Granada, he had a very bright idea, uh, why don't we start two actors working on the same theme with, them, with two different directors, one working on them for, for uh, television, one for stage, and then see how they develop. Don't let them communicate, see how they develop. And out of that form a process which is enabled to be translated for actors so that they understand the difference when you are on stage and text bound and in front of a camera. And I thought I can use this. And so uh, uh, um, Mountview uh, Theatre School in north of London, which had used me as a, uh, as a theatre director quite a lot, asked me to start a television department at, in their college, which I did. And that was more or less, more or less the end of my, my career as a director. This is a 1938, so it must be one of the last batch that were made before the war, before Austin turned over to um, uh, wartime production. London taxis, they rebuilt so they had a very good turning circle. This one takes half an airfield to turn around, but then it's a gracious thing for driving ancient doctors over the moors, not anything that you wish to rush about nasty little modern streets with. I'll just put my seatbelt on. <laughs> you don't need them. <laughs> 